Hi, everyone. Um, I am uh, Nancy McLernan, and I am the CEO of the Global Business Alliance. Uh, we were supposed to have Bridget here with us, uh, who heads up the Institute for International Bankers, um, but something seems to have gone wrong with her video. So I'll just go ahead uh, and start it. Um, again, my name is Nancy McLernan, um, President and CEO of the Global Business Alliance. We're so excited uh, to be hosting this fourth uh, session of the Economic Advisory Council with the Institute of International Bankers. And sorry that Bridget's um, video seems to have uh, gone uh, awry, uh, but we're really pleased um, to have all of you here with us. Before I go over our, our agenda, a uh, quick word about the Global Business Alliance. GBA is a trade association based in Washington, DC, representing about 200 international companies doing business in the United States. Our members operate across a very wide variety of industries, uh, including manufacturing, retail, and of course the financial sector. Um, and we're joined by one of uh, our members here today. Um, GBA advocates for policies to help ensure the United States may, remains the most competitive location around the world for foreign direct investment. And foreign-based companies have already invested $5 trillion into the U.S. economy. And the U.S. subsidiaries of foreign companies employ almost 8 million Americans uh, directly. Um, in the manufacturing space, um, they, they uh, employ um, almost 2.9 um, million Americans. And they're producing here not only to serve uh, U.S. consumers, um, but many foreign-owned companies in the United States produce here to serve consumers around the world. Um, today, our speaker, Robert Dent, is going to give a presentation detailing what factors may influence the Federal Reserve's uh, September meeting and what economic factors are likely to be the key signals for where the economy is heading into November. Following uh, Rob's um, uh, remarks, and he's got some really great slides to lead us through it, uh, we'll have some Q&A from the audience. Um, so now I'd like to introduce um, uh, No More America and our speaker. Hey there, Rob. Hey, Nancy. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So No More is a global financial services group with an integrated network spanning over 30 countries and regions. By connecting markets east and west, No More serves uh, services the needs of individuals, institutions, corporations, and governments. Founded in 1925, the firm uh, is built on a tradition of disciplined entrepreneurship, serving clients with creative solutions and considered thought leadership. No More subsidiaries in the U.S. include No More Securities International um, and No More Corporate Research and Asset Management. Rob is a senior U.S. economist in the Americas uh, at No More. Before joining Nomura, Rob was head research analyst at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where he focused on labor market and firm dynamics. Rob holds a BA uh, in economics and mathematics from the University of Virginia. I'll, I'll forgive you for that because I went to Virginia Tech. Uh, and you can catch him on TV or being interviewed as he is regularly sought after for his expertise. So with that, Rob, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, really interested to hear um, uh, what what you think uh, is the outlook ahead. So over to you. Thanks very much, Nancy. And uh, no hard feelings about Virginia Tech. Uh, we're all we're all in Virginia. So um, look, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to the GBA and IIB for for having me on. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about just how we're thinking about the broad macro economy in the U.S., what we think that means for Federal Reserve policy. And ultimately, um, you know, where that's going to lead uh, the economy over the next six to 12 months. We are entering kind of a very interesting cycle right now. Uh, we think that we're at kind of a critical juncture uh, heading into the end of 2022. And so there's quite a lot to talk about. I'm going to try to focus on a couple of key points to get through, but we will have an opportunity for questions at the end. If there's something more specific that participants would like to focus on uh, that I don't touch on. So with that, um, I will get started with the slides that I've prepped for today. Um, the broad theme is just going to be an update on and the outlook for uh, the U.S. economy. A couple of different things that I would like to highlight at the outset. The first is that the U.S. economy is entering this really critical period in the end of 2022. Inflationary pressures remain acute, generating a very strong response from the Fed. Growth is slowing across a range of sectors, and the global outlook is quite uncertain. Uh, 
we think there are kind of four critical things to watch. The first is the behavior of inflation, particularly trend measures. The second is uh, the trajectory of consumer sentiment and real consumer spending. The third is impact of higher rates and slower external growth on the U.S. economy. And then finally, what that all means uh, in terms of a response from the Federal Reserve, which we believe is increasingly a single mandate central bank focusing on inflation. Ultimately, we do think that a recession is more likely than not at this point. Um, a soft landing is still possible, but inflation in the labor market may not really cool uh, without a downturn uh, over the next year or so. So starting with inflation, um, a couple of points to make. The first is that headline inflation on a month over month basis measured by CPI has moderated over the past two months due to falling gasoline prices. If you look at that left hand side chart, the gray bars are very negative right now. That's weighing on overall headline CPI. That being said, the red bars and the pink bars representing core uh, inflation and food prices are both still pretty elevated. And that's also showing up in trend measures of inflation. So the right hand side chart here is looking at the median and range of four different trend CPI inflation measures coming from a different, uh, couple different Federal Reserve banks uh, in Atlanta and Cleveland, along with our own measures. Those are sitting at around 8% month over month at an annualized rate. That's very, very elevated by historical standards, and they really haven't moved all that much. And so what we think this means is that inflation right now has become very entrenched in the US economy. It is no longer a story of just higher energy prices or higher food prices. It's really taking hold um, across a number of different sectors. So thinking about inflation and the Fed's initial concern, um, the left-hand side chart here is showing uh, measures of good supply disruptions in pink from the New York Fed. Higher uh, in the pink series means more supply disruptions. The gray line is showing you real goods consumption, uh, the deviation from its 2012 to 2019 trend. And the red line is showing you the deviation of prices from their 2012 to 2019 trend. And so this chart really encapsulates the entire initial story of inflation for the Fed. Good supply and demand imbalances push the Fed to initially target lowering goods demand as a way to constrain inflation. Uh, that was the story up until around the end of, of 2021. The problem is that late last year, inflation really began to broaden out beyond just goods affected components into services. If you look at the right hand side chart, this is looking at the percent of PCE inflation components, the Fed's preferred measure that are rising more than 5% month over month at an annualized pace. Right now it's sitting at around 60%. That's the highest level since the 1980s. And so we really can't explain inflation anymore just by looking at something like used car prices or retail gasoline prices. This is a story that is increasingly about services. It's increasingly about wages as well. So in line with that evolving inflation story, um, very strong wage growth and evidence of a wage price spiral suggests the labor market needs to weaken significantly. On the left hand side here, we are just looking at core services prices on a PCE basis. So this is kind of the prices of services across the broader economy year over year, along with the employment cost index or ECI's services wage growth. These are both kind of the Fed's preferred measure of looking at these, uh, these different concepts. Now, what's going on recently is that services wage growth has accelerated very, very sharply and services prices are now appearing to respond to that. And so this is a fundamentally different dynamic than goods driven inflation. We think it is now more entrenched within the services side of the economy itself. It is being driven by tight labor markets and very elevated wage growth. At the same time, inflation expectations, which are kind of a key determinant of where inflation will be over the longer horizon, have started to de-anchor, we think, for consumers. If you look at the right hand side chart here, this is looking at the distribution of long term consumer inflation expectations at three specific points in time. The pink dashed line is the distribution as of June 2019. That's effectively your pre COVID benchmark. At that point, most consumers were expecting long term inflation to be between one and four percent. We would characterize that as being very well anchored. The distribution is pretty tight around where most of the mass is. There's not a lot of mass in the tails. Now, the solid red line is from September of 2022. That's the most recent data that we have. That is showing a considerably flatter overall distribution. Uh, we think what's happening is that while the median hasn't moved that much, so the median in September was 2.8% versus 2.5% about two years ago, the distribution itself is quite flat. A lot of consumers are moving around their expectations for where they think long-term inflation will ultimately settle. Now, why is that concerning? 
The gray dashed line shows you what this distribution looked like in January of 1981, when we basically thought that uh, consumer inflation expectations were completely unanchored. That distribution, similar to the one today, was characterized by being very, very flat. Uh, and so we think there's a lot of concern that if these inflation expectations really do unanchor, it could mean higher for longer overall inflation. And this is something the Fed needs to effectively work very hard against uh, to make sure it does not happen. Okay, so that brings us to kind of the consumer outlook and how we should be thinking about the broader growth uh, trajectory heading into the end of this year. The first thing to note is that recent strong NFP gains or non-farm payroll employment gains have been sustained by cyclically insensitive industries. So what does that mean? If we look at about 300 different industries that make up month over month employment growth or month over month NFP growth in the US economy, we can group them into three different groups depending on how sensitive they are to GDP growth. The red bars and that left-hand side chart show you the industries that are most sensitive to GDP growth. So these are the ones like manufacturing, like accommodation and food services, where if growth slows down, they slow down quite a bit. The gray and the kind of green teal bars are showing you industries that aren't quite as cyclically sensitive. Uh, they're more similar to things like healthcare, education, industries that don't really respond as much to the business cycle, at least initially. And so you'll see many economic commentators recently saying, well, NFP growth is very, very strong. And so that must mean the overall economy is doing very well. There's some truth to that. Hiring is at historically elevated levels. But if you look under the surface, a lot of this is being sustained by industries that don't tell you very much about where the overall growth cycle is going. And that's one reason why we think NFP growth is overstating economic momentum to a certain degree. To corroborate that view, if you look at the right-hand side chart, this is showing you the same three groupings of different industries in terms of month-over-month -month private NFP growth, but looking instead at the period from 2004 to 2013, when we went through the GFC or the global financial crisis. Now, at that point, those least and moderate uh, industries in terms of their cyclically sensitive uh, behavior really didn't respond all that much at the initial stages of the recession. In fact, if you had relied on the least cyclically sensitive industries to kind of forecast where the business cycle was going to be, you would have been off at that point by about 12 months. And so we think it's really, really important to watch the most cyclically sensitive NFP industries like manufacturing and the combination and food services, services, because ultimately those give us a much better read on where the economy itself will be um, over the next six to 12 months. That's very important from a forecasting perspective. On top of that for consumers, you know, we really think that the labor market right now can only do so much. Um, while the unemployment rate remains historically low at around 3.7%, Elevated inflation at this moment is weighing on real incomes and purchasing power. So one way to look at this is to use something called the misery index, which really hasn't been talked about very much since the 1980s. That index looks at deviations from 2% uh, for inflation, along with deviations from its longer run level for the unemployment rate and kind of maps them into the single index to say, those two things combined tell us a lot about the outlook for consumers. So Right now, that misery index is sitting at around levels that we last saw during the global financial crisis. And that, we think, really underscores how even with a very, very strong labor market, consumers can still be experiencing a lot of pain. And we think part of that's happening right now in the broader economy. In line with that, if you look at the right-hand side chart, this is just showing the unemployment rate in gray, along with the percent of consumers who report being worse off financially relative to 12 months ago in red. That comes from the University of Michigan Consumer Survey. Those two series since 1990 tracked each other very, very well, but have diverged significantly since then. Uh, during the pandemic, basically what happened is elevated inflation made consumers feel worse off financially. That created this big wedge between labor market outcomes and broader consumer sentiment. And we think that's very important kind of heading into the end of this year. Just what can we see about consumer sentiment? Can it improve? Uh, what does that tell us about the outlook for consumer spending and the broader economy? So thinking about specifically consumer sentiment, um, I think there are a couple of different points to make. The first is that right now, based on the University of Michigan survey, consumer sentiment remains historically depressed due to elevated inflation um, and recession concerns. That left-hand side chart is showing the consumer sentiment index from the University of Michigan going back to the early 1950s. We are off the lows that we experienced a couple of months ago, but at 59.5, that's still pretty low compared to its historical average. That's right around where we were 
during the global financial crisis. And again, I do think this comes back to uh, the outlook for inflation and what consumers are grappling with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, if we look at the right-hand side chart, this is just decomposing, you know, what are the different factors that are driving that decline relative to the recent peak in February of 2020? The University of Michigan survey has about five major indicators that determine where the top line index is. Uh, those are displayed right here, showing their contribution to the overall decline uh, over the past two years. Now, the single largest contributor is buying conditions for large household items. That's about 13 percentage points of the overall 40 percentage point decline. We think that's largely being driven by higher prices for things like uh, vehicles, for things like appliances and televisions. Um, Prices for those were disrupted during the pandemic. They rose quite a bit. They have not yet really come off. And so that's weighing on top line sentiment. In addition, current financial situations for households and expected business conditions over the next year are also weighing on consumer sentiment quite a bit. Um, I think you know, one way that that could be fixed is if inflation does come down more quickly than we and others expect, uh, consumers might start to feel a little bit better about their financial situations because the labor market is still pretty strong. Now, finally, expected financial situations and expected business conditions over the next five years are down, but they're actually not down as much as the current conditions measure. So over the longer term, we think consumers still have good reason to be optimistic. Many of them still think that inflation should move lower, the unemployment rate will remain kind of low, and so they should be able to spend over the medium and the longer term. It's just right now in a high inflation environment, there are a lot of headwinds facing consumers. And so we think that's one reason why consumers by themselves are no longer going to be enough to kind of avoid a mild recession in the US, uh, just given all of the different headwinds that they're facing uh, at this moment. So putting all of the consumer pieces together and what does this mean for the next three months? Um, there are a couple of different things to highlight. The first is that because we're in a really high inflation environment, it's really important to look at real activity as opposed to nominal activity because high inflation is gonna be boosting all of the nominal numbers that we're used to tracking. We have not needed to really look at this since the 1980s when inflation was exceptionally high. And so for many market participants, businesses and consumers, it's a new way to look at the economy. You need to make sure you're dealing effectively on a quantity basis as opposed to uh, a nominal values basis. So why is that so important? If you look at the left-hand side chart, this is looking at core or control retail sales, uh, one of the most important inputs for consumer spending um, in the economy. Uh, indexed to June of 2021, and then just running forward what's happened on a nominal basis versus a real basis. So if you're living in a nominal world where all you're doing is following the nominal indicators, um, core retail sales look okay. They're up about 6.5% since the middle of last year. Uh, they were flat in August, but have been on that gradual upward trajectory. However, if you look at the real numbers in the gray line, um, that's actually telling a completely different story, right? Real core retail sales are down about 1.5 percentage points since June of last year. And so the actual quantity and amount that consumers are spending and, and consuming uh, is much lower than it was, you know, a year and a half ago. And I think that's a really important point when we're thinking about what's going to be happening over the next couple of months. It really is going to be determined by real activity um, as opposed to nominal. Now, the other thing to know about consumer spending is that there's been this huge change in how consumers are actually spending during the pandemic itself. So because services was so constrained at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, many consumers pushed over into goods, you know, ordering offline, ordering at home, all of that became uh, much easier. If you look at the data, what happened was good spending, the gray line on the right-hand side chart, jumped considerably above its trend from 2012 to 2019. Since about early 2021, it's been coming back down to trend very gradually. As the economy reopens, consumers are shifting back to services. That's the red line there. So from about you know, mid to early 2021 to around early 2022, we saw this really important rotation of spending. Yes, good spending was coming off, but at the same time, services spending was coming back. And so we weren't that worried about the consumer outlook. More recently, however, good spending has continued to move lower but services relative to its trend has really flattened out. And so we're becoming more worried that already consumers are pulling back on real services activity, right? Vacations have become more expensive. Traveling is more expensive. Maybe they're not going out to eat as much at restaurants because of higher food prices. And so that's meaning that the services line in red is kind of flatlining right now. Uh, and that's another big concern is that this rotation from goods to services might actually be faltering at this point.
Okay, a couple of comments on interest rate sensitive sectors, just because the Fed has raised rates so, so rapidly, rates in the US even this week are still moving higher at a very rapid clip. And so that has implications for the side of the economy that is just much more susceptible to higher rates. When we're thinking about that, we just have to start with the housing market. That is gonna be the kind of the kicking off point for any type of weaker activity due to higher interest rates. So interest rate sensitive activity broadly has started to decline pretty significantly. If we look at the left-hand side chart here, this is looking at year-over-year -year changes in existing home sales in the US, along with year-over-year -year changes in home affordability, which tends to lead existing home sales by about six months. Now, existing home sales have fallen by about 20% year over year as mortgage rates have risen very, very sharply to over 6% as of last week. Um, and based on home affordability, they probably have further to go in terms of how far they're going to decline. Um, now, at the same time, the earlier phenomenon of rapidly rising prices is also showing up in, uh, in addition to the consumer sector, the business sector as well. So if we look on the right-hand side chart, this is showing nominal and real core capital goods shipments. One really simple way to think about this is just business equipment investment, right? How much are businesses investing in their production processes, how, you know, how they're setting up their offices, what type of tech they're equipping their workers with, all of that is showing up in this series. Now, on a year over year basis, the real and the nominal series, the real in red and the nominal in gray, tracked each other very, very well. More recently, however, real and nominal have diverged quite a bit because the PPI deflator, the producer price index deflator that we use for deflating this business equipment investment has been rising very, very quickly in black um, on that right hand side chart. And so even with business equipment investment, this real versus nominal story is showing up. And if you look at the real data activity for businesses who are very interest rate sensitive because a lot of these purchases depend on financing is already starting to contract um, and looks relatively weak overall. And so these higher rates are also filtering into the economy. It's going to be important over the next couple of months to see, do we see any signs of stabilization in the housing market if rates can stabilize? Do we see any signs that business equipment investment is starting to level off instead of contracting? So far, it hasn't shown up, but that's going to be very important going into the end of 2022. Okay, so what does this all mean in terms of implications for the Fed and the broader economic outlook at this point? So the first place to start is we really do expect an unprecedented modern era hiking cycle from the Fed. Um, this chart on the slide is showing you the past four Fed hiking cycles indexed to the initial rate at which they lift off from. Um, and basically looking at 2015, the most recent one before COVID, 2004 and 1994, uh, juxtaposed against our current forecast in the red dashed line for what we expect the Fed to be doing you know, over the forecast horizon. Now, due to persistently elevated inflation, um, we really do expect the Fed to raise rates by 450 basis points um, over 12 months. Compared to the prior four hiking cycles, uh, there just is no really good historical precedent for this. Um, the best we have is essentially 1994, where the Fed raised rates by about 300 basis points um, over 12 months, or maybe the 2004 hiking cycle where it wasn't as front loaded, but they rose rates by they raised rates by about 425 basis points um, over about two years. Now, you know, understanding the current Fed environment really requires looking closely at these shifting inflation forces that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, top of mind would be it's no longer just a vehicles and goods and supply chain disruption story. It is now really a services and wages story, which is just fundamentally different than what the Fed was dealing with even 12 months ago. Uh, but this also makes the point that, you know, wages do not tend to go down uh, unless we're having a recession. That's just how they operate historically. The labor market stays tight during expansions, putting upward pressure on wages, putting upward pressure on inflation expectations. And so we do think that at this point, um, a recession, you know, ultimately will be required uh, to restore price stability in the U.S. And so this chart just kind of makes the point that this really is a totally different environment for businesses, for market participants, for consumers. And we need to approach it using kind of a new way of thinking about what the Fed is doing without trying to relate it as closely back to these previous cycles. It is just fundamentally uh, so different at this point. Now, on top of that, it's really important to emphasize that while technically the Fed has a dual mandate from Congress focusing on labor markets and price stability, along with moderate long-term interest rates, uh, 
Uh, we think at this point the Fed has become a single mandate central bank focusing almost exclusively on inflation. And one question is, you know, why is that, right? Why would they prioritize inflation over labor markets at this point? Um, we think that in the long run, labor market strength is typically achieved uh, during these very long expansions, right? During recessions, typically what happens is the workers who are most disadvantaged tend to lose their jobs first and they tend to see the benefits of a hot labor market last. And so the best way to have these very long expansions, uh, these very strong labor markets is to have these very long expansions. Um, now, to have long expansions in a macro environment like the US for the past you know, 50 or 60 years, you need to have low and stable inflation. Just to make that point, uh, the chart here is showing US expansion since 1960. Each dot represents a different expansion. Uh, the y-axis is looking at the expansion length in years, and the x-axis is looking at the average year-over-year -year CPI inflation rate for that expansion. Um, a couple of things jump out right off the bat, right? The expansions that tend to be short also tended to have very, very high inflation. Uh, you think about 1980, 1975, 1970, our expectation for 2020 when we think we're going to enter a recession uh, later this year. The expansions that tend to be very long and see the best benefits for labor markets are those that have very low inflation, right? The expansion that started in 2009, the one from 1991 and 1961. So the Fed, we think at least over the next couple of quarters is going to be largely insensitive to recession risk because their view is we might need to have a recession right now to restore low and stable inflation, but that will ultimately benefit the U.S. economy in the long run because it will mean longer you know, labor market expansions, healthier labor markets in the long run, and they can focus on their dual mandate once we get on the other side of this downturn that we think is ultimately coming. So that brings us to the kind of recession itself and, and what we're expecting in terms of its shape and its overall characteristics. So, um, you know, in terms of the overall shape of the recession, we think it's going to be pretty mild. If you look at the left-hand side chart on this slide, it is showing you real GDP indexed to its peak going back for different recessions since the 1960s. Now, the red solid line is our forecast for what we're expecting for this cycle. You'll notice that peak to trough, we're looking for a roughly 1.5 percentage point decline in real GDP. Now, that's relatively mild, right? If we think about what happened during the global financial crisis, that solid teal line, real GDP you know, declined by more than double what we're currently expecting uh, for this upcoming recession. Now, that being said, um, there is a bit of a downside, which is that we think there's going to be five consecutive quarters of negative real GDP growth. And so it's going to be a little bit longer uh, than your average recession, especially if you compare it to something like, you know, 1981 or maybe 2001, where it's even a little bit difficult to see the 2001 recession show up in the growth forecast. So what's going on here? What's giving the shape of slow and gradual deceleration, uh, but ultimately kind of longer than expected recession? And, and we would point out a couple of things. The first is that you know, consumers right now are actually doing very, very well. Consumer balance sheets themselves are quite healthy. Debt service ratios are very low uh, because of a lot of the pandemic related support that went out. Um, consumers were able to kind of pay down debt, accumulate a lot of excess savings, um, and their wealth to income ratios are quite high. And so while in real terms, consumers are pulling back on spending, they're not rapidly cutting purchases like we saw during the global financial crisis when there was effectively a systemic housing component to the downturn. We don't see anything that necessarily means uh, there's going to be a systemic risk for this recession. We think it's more of a mild recession aimed at loosening labor market conditions and bringing wage growth lower. So that means consumers shouldn't pull back very, very sharply, limiting just how quickly you go in. Now, the downside, of course, is that that longer trajectory for the overall recession we think is being driven primarily by the policymaker response. So if you think about what the Fed typically does during a recession, their playbook is to cut rates very, very quickly, very, very rapidly uh, to the effective lower bound and start engaging in large scale asset purchases or quantitative easing. We actually think they're gonna be doing effectively the opposite of that, right? We think they're gonna be hiking into the end of this year, even into the very beginning of 2023 we think they will hold rates at a very restrictive level of around 4.5 to 4.75% through most of next year. And despite the fact that we're gonna be in four quarters of recession by September, they're only gonna start cutting rates at that point and only very gradually by 25 basis points per meeting. So the monetary policy response to this recession is just gonna be fundamentally different 
and we think that's going to effectively prolong it. Now, on fiscal policy, we have sort of similar views. Now, we don't have a direct forecast of what's going to happen in the midterms, uh, but it feels to us like the conversations in Washington right now suggest that the appetite for additional fiscal stimulus after everything that was done during COVID is pretty low. And so we are not assuming any additional fiscal policy support uh, for this recession that's coming up. We think that Congress and you know the executive branch will largely be on the sidelines for this one. There will be some impact from automatic stabilizers that kick in like unemployment insurance, but we do not think we're going to get the type of stimulus checks or tax breaks that we saw during COVID-19, largely because those things could ultimately exacerbate inflation. Uh, and I think right now the top priority for most policymakers is making sure that inflation does ultimately move lower. So what does this mean for the labor market and what does that mean for the next three months? Um, right now, as we've been talking about, the labor market is quite strong, right? Month over month NFP growth is pretty solid. The unemployment rate is around 50 year lows, but we do think the unemployment rate will eventually increase along with this mild recession. The right hand side chart, that red dashed line is showing you our forecast for the unemployment rate in red. Um, in addition, it's giving you a sense of just what different unemployment rate trajectories would mean, right? So the teal line is showing you what the unemployment rate trajectory would be if we had a recession similar to the global financial crisis. So in that case, you're thinking about an unemployment rate of around eight to 9%. We don't think that's all that likely at this point. We think five to 6% is kind of the right base case. That's more similar to what we saw in the 2001 cycle, uh, which is that dark blue dashed line. And so that gives you a bit of a sense of just what are the different options for how the unemployment rate could unfold. We think it's going to be a little bit more mild than average, but there is a decent amount of uncertainty around that. OK, so so far, uh, I think for many people kind of tuning in for this call, um, this might feel like a little bit of a pessimistic outlook. You know, we are expecting weaker labor market conditions. Inflation is pretty entrenched. All of that's going to be coming to a head over the next couple of months um, towards the end of 2022. But that being said, there is still kind of a narrow path to a soft landing. And by soft landing, we mean instead of a recession, you know, maybe the labor market weakens a little bit, maybe growth comes in below potential, and that's enough to bring inflation lower. And so I do think that's still kind of an optimistic case that's possible, even if it's not our base case at this point. And it's worth thinking a little bit more about what are the conditions that could give way uh, to that specific outcome. So the first point to make is that the national inflation conversation we think really needs to improve for that to be likely. Um, right now, inflation feels to us to be very much a dinner table issue, which is making it a bit of a self-fulfilling cycle. You know, consumers are talking a lot about high inflation. They're accepting higher prices. Firms are expecting high inflation, and so they're setting higher prices. Workers are bargaining for higher wages. It's all part of the conversation that's happening in the U.S. So what does that mean to see it become less of a national conversation? And I would point to two things. The first is the conversation among consumers. So this left-hand side chart is showing you um, a series from the University of Michigan Consumer Survey that asks, you know, have you heard any bad news about high prices this month? Um, this is the percent of consumers who report yes. Now, this is indexed to the previous four hiking cycles that we've been talking about earlier, 1994, 2004, 2015, and 2022 in the red. You'll notice that red line really stands out. I think that goes a long way to explaining why we're expecting a more aggressive Fed response in this environment. But recently, it started to move a little bit lower. And so part of this is probably due to falling gas prices. I think consumers pay a lot of attention to that. If we're going to have a soft landing, I think we need to see continued downward movement in that series, right? Consumers not thinking as much about inflation. I'm sure everybody on this call uh, has been talking about inflation to their friends, to their families. It is really top of mind right now. If we can get to a point where it is no longer part of this national conversation, that might increase the likelihood of a soft landing itself. On the business side, it's a similar story. Uh, that right-hand side chart is looking at the percent of small businesses reporting inflation as their, quote, single most important problem. This comes from the NFIB. Now, this series, um, you know, indexed the same way as the chart on the left-hand side, looking at the four different uh, hiking cycles, showing a very, very similar pattern, right? Small businesses reporting a lot of concern about inflation, although recently it's starting to come off. You know, supply chains are improving and retail gas prices are falling. Maybe that's helping. But I think similar to consumers, businesses also need to feel a little bit of relief in the sense that they're no longer talking about inflation so much, no longer incorporating it into all of their decisions that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so step number one, I think, for that soft landing 
um, really needs to be, you know, nas the national inflation conversation just has to improve. On this topic, I think it's really important to point out for market participants, consumers, and businesses, just how to think about the Fed's definition of price stability. Um, you know, if we ask most economists what price stability means, most of them will tell you the Fed has a 2% inflation target. And so price stability should mean inflation around 2%. We actually don't think that's completely right. Um, yes, the Fed has a 2% inflation target, but when they think about price stability, the most important input to that is, are households and businesses making decisions every day, taking inflation into consideration? If the answer is no, then that's price stability, right? If you're driving your kids to school um, and you're not thinking about inflation, then you know we're probably in a price st stable uh, realm. If, however, on a day-to-day -day basis, you are making decisions based on inflation, if you're picking, you know, maybe I'll cook at home tonight instead of going out to the restaurant we like to go to, or I'm going to go shop at kind of a discount retailer because my normal retailer's prices are rising so rapidly, that's not a stable prices environment. And so that's really the definition of price stability that I think the Fed cares most about. And based on these two charts, we just really aren't there yet. Um, I think there's a lot of work to do ahead of the Fed to kind of make sure we get back to the point where people aren't thinking about this um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, in addition to the national inflation conversation improving, um, I think we also need to see a couple of other things for uh, a soft landing to really materialize. And the most important is a broader recovery in the supply side of the labor market. Now, if we think that very, very tight labor markets are driving wage growth higher, which is ultimately feeding through into prices and pushing the Fed to weaken the labor market, um, you know, one answer would be, well, if labor supply comes back, then maybe that'll put downward pressure on wages and downward pressure on prices. In that light, over the next three months, it will be very, very important to watch the trajectories for labor force participation in the US. Now, for workers who are aged 25 to 54, this left-hand side chart is showing that their labor force participation rate is really kind of coming back to pre-pandemic levels, uh, which is quite encouraging. If that continues and even surpasses pre-pandemic levels, maybe a soft landing is more possible. That being said, total labor force participation is still pretty low. Um, a big part of that is excess retirements that took place during COVID. Maybe if some of those workers also come back, it will be a big improvement for the labor side of the economy uh, and mean that wage growth won't be as persistent as we expect. In addition to that, the natural rate of unemployment trajectory we think is also very important. Now, this is kind of an esoteric economic concept that doesn't really matter on a day-to-day -day basis, but it does matter when you're thinking about how much slack is in the labor market. When we think about the natural rate of unemployment or U star in that red line on the right-hand side, that really determines for any given level of the unemployment rate, are things very tight? Are things very loose? You know, What does that mean for wage growth? Right now, the unemployment rate in gray is considerably below that measure of U star in red, meaning that the labor market right now is really, really overheating. But U star has moved lower. And so there is kind of an outcome where if U star continues to move lower, maybe the unemployment rate won't need to go up quite as much as we're expecting. And that could also help uh, facilitate a soft landing in the current environment. And so over the next couple of months, these are gonna be really important factors to keep in mind when determining, you know, is our base case right? Are we heading for that mild recession to loosen labor market conditions, to get wage growth lower and to get inflation back down to 2%? Or are we seeing a broader recovery on the supply side? Maybe that means U star is also moving lower and we can become a little bit more optimistic about, you know, the Fed might be able to pull off a soft landing. I think that's going to be a critical theme as we head into the end of 2022. So just a couple of closing thoughts uh, before we move into the Q&A part of, of today's call. Um, this really is an unprecedented time for many consumers, businesses and market participants. This is the first real inflation shock that we've had since the 1980s. It means that the way that we track and interpret data uh, requires more careful analysis. We can no longer just look at nominal retail sales, for example, or nominal core business equipment investment. We have to look at the real levels to give us a sense of where overall activity is actually heading. Now, while we do think uh, a recession is most likely needed to kind of dislodge entrenched inflation, that's really coming from the notion that wages and no longer supply disruptions are increasingly the main driver of excess price growth in the US. And labor markets just typically do not cool all that much during expansions, uh, looking back at the past 60 or 70 years of data. Uh, those things tell us that at this point, a downturn might be needed to actually correct uh, the current equilibrium uh, that we're in. 
So in that regard, you know, a soft landing is still possible, but it requires a combination of, you know, increasingly unlikely supply shocks, um, a broad recovery in labor force participation or a decline in U star would be really good starting points. Uh, but by themselves, we don't think that's going to be necessarily be enough uh, to bring about a soft landing, although that will be very important heading into the end of this year. And so, you know, just in closing, it's it's going to be difficult. I think there are a couple of months ahead of us that are really going to determine, you know, is this base case right or is a soft landing more important? Um, it's hard to think back to a macro environment where that's been as clear as it is now. And so that just means the next few months heading into the end of 2022 um, are going to be really critical for just thinking about where the economy is going to be um, over the next year to, to, to two years. Um, so I will go ahead and stop there and we can now turn things over for a question and answer. Great. Thanks so much, Rob. We, we already have some questions coming in, so I'll go ahead and, and uh, read the first one we have. So how will a more restrictive monetary and fiscal policy abroad impact the probability and severity of a recession in the U.S. over the next 12, 24 months? Absolutely. So we think that's part of what's driving our recession call is just this very, very weak outlook for external growth beyond the U.S. You know, our colleagues who forecast uh, the European economy, including the UK and the broader EA, um, are expecting a recession to take place in Europe uh, starting around the end of this year, early next year. They may already be in a recession at this point. Um, and so part of that is just globally, central banks are raising rates very, very quickly. They're pulling back a little bit on the fiscal measures that were put in place for COVID. And so that is part of the recession story that I think we're telling. That being said, it's still a very domestic story for the U.S., right? One problem is that the inflation situation that the U.S. is facing is no longer an imported inflation situation. It's really one that's generated by domestic factors. And so even if you didn't have those downshifting uh, economic trajectories abroad in places like Europe and China and others, I think the U.S. would still likely need to go through some sort of broad slowdown just to get the labor market to be where policymakers want it. Okay, great. Um, so I have a question for you um, regarding Congress. So you indicated that there's not a lot that Congress, uh, that you would expect Congress to do given the state of sort of, uh, you know, a very um, uh, close uh, D and R uh, situation on Capitol Hill. Um, but if you could talk to policymakers and, and advise them on what could be most helpful what what would you say is the key action that they can help to combat inflation? And is there anything that the executive branch can do outside of Congress? This is a really great question. Um, you know, looking back at the history of kind of inflation in the U.S. and the executive branch and the, the legislative branch, the action that we can expect from them to actually bring prices lower, I think, is a little bit limited. A really extreme example would be the price and wage controls that former President Nixon tried to implement in the 1970s. Um, those did not work particularly well. I think that's only really one thing the executive branch could look at. Um, for Congress, you know, it really comes down to how stimulative is fiscal policy. Um, one really simple answer would be maybe this is the right time to raise taxes, although I'm not really sure Congress wants to do that in an environment where we're going into a recession. Um, and so the short answer is it's pretty hard for the executive branch or the legislative branch to really influence inflation at this point. I think that's one reason why for the past 40 years, inflation has really been the purview of the Federal Reserve. Um, I think one of the best things that policymakers in Washington might be able to do is just let the Fed have its independence that it's had for the past 40 or 50 years, right? Inflation is ultimately kind of a monetary phenomenon and the Fed has the tools to deal with it. And so maybe this is a point where it's time to say, okay, the Federal Reserve is gonna raise rates, Maybe that comes with a little bit of pain, but we're prepared to accept that because having an independent central bank is so important for the long-term outlook in the U.S. Okay, um, next question I have here is, uh, so historically rates haven't risen this quickly as you've mentioned since the 1980s. Is there any indication from the past that can inform us, we talked a little bit about this, um, about the decisions being made today? Absolutely. You know, one one really important you know, person in the 1980s was former Fed chair Paul Volcker. Um, he essentially said, I'm not going to back off, you know, restrictive monetary policy until I see inflation actually come down. 
I think the current Fed is drawing a lot of lessons from that playbook. They're kind of looking at Volcker as the right person to be following in the current environment. And so that's a great place to start when thinking about, um, you know, what does the current environment mean for monetary policy more broadly? Um, other lessons from the 80s, you know, the, the recession in the 80s was pretty severe. Um, we aren't expecting it to be as severe. And one reason is that relative to the 1980s, Inflation expectations are actually pretty well anchored right now in the US, despite our concerns that they're starting to shift a little bit. And so that's a really important lesson is that one reason the recession was so deep in the 80s was because they had to raise rates and change the overall inflation psychology of the country. Um, we don't really face that same problem today. It's budding a little bit. I think it's kind of creeping up, uh, but I think the Fed's task is a little bit easier from that time. Uh, but broadly speaking, you know, a higher rates environment is always gonna be weighing pretty heavily on the housing sector first. I think we're seeing that right now in the US. And so that's one of the most straightforward parallels I think to draw um, you know, from that period. Okay, turning back to Congress, um, uh, from a practical standpoint, um, what influence do you believe the Inflation Reduction Act will have on America's economy? Yeah, so you know the, the Inflation Reduction Act or, or IRA, I think, is kind of a good first step in the direction of, you know, maybe we need to do a little bit more in terms of investing on, uh, you know, things to kind of mitigate the impacts of climate change over the next couple of years. It feels like that's been very top of mind for many policymakers in Washington, many businesses, many people around the world. And so from that point of view, the spending that was put in place to kind of increase incentives for clean energy production, you know, clean, clean energy usage, I think is a good step in the right direction. Um, the U.S. does have a bit of a long-term fiscal sustainability problem, and so the fact that a lot of the spending was offset by higher taxes from different areas is also kind of a good sign that, um, you know, over the 10-year the window that people look at for this bill, um, it actually reduces the deficit by about $300 billion, um, or about $30 billion per year. Now, that being said, you know, those are kind of positives, I think, for the, the composition of overall U.S. economic activity. But the broad impact might not be as large as many people expect. Um, for one reason, you know, if we think about just the overall size of this, $300 billion in spending um, over 10 years isn't really that much in the grand scheme of things. Just to put that in perspective, all of the fiscal support that was put in place during the pandemic uh, totaled up to about $5.1 trillion, right? So just a different order of magnitude. So that's one reason why we think of this as being kind of a good step in the direction of maybe doing a little bit more to mitigate some of these issues around living with climate change. Uh, but I think, you know, maybe there's more that needs to be done. Um, if you're a fan of kind of increasing US productivity by doing continuous infrastructure investment, then, you know, there's more there that I think could be looked at. Great, thanks. Um, next question I have here is, how can the US remain a competitive place to invest um, when, the Fed's goals, of course, is to slow the economy. So how can we stay competitive? I would say, you know, right now, the equilibrium that we're in just doesn't really feel sustainable to us, right? Having headline CPI inflation at around 8% on a year over year basis increases a lot of market uncertainty. It increases a lot of economic uncertainty. It increases difficulty for businesses planning their longer term outlooks. You have to think about you know, is inflation something I need to take into consideration when I'm making investment decisions for the next five to 10 years? And so, you know, yes, a slower U.S. economy and a more restrictive Federal Reserve on the surface looks a little bit negative for the U.S. outlook if we're thinking about comparing it to our global peers. Uh, but I think in the longer term, the outcome that the Fed is aiming for is one where businesses have more certainty around where inflation is going to be over the next five to 10 years that should make investment decisions easier, that should make planning a little bit easier. And so it's a little bit of a story of short-term pain for longer-term gain. And so to some degree, if you are looking outside in at the US and you're seeing the Fed kind of do what it takes to restore us to that equilibrium that's a little bit more stable, um, I think your confidence should kind of go up, right? You're saying, okay, policymakers are doing what's necessary to give uh, you know, investors the right outcome for the long-term. And so, you know, that's one reason why, you know, yes, we have kind of this pessimistic forecast around a recession, but I think we're optimistic on, on the medium term, right? This is really about making sure the foundations of, of the economy are, are in a healthy place. And so from that point of view, we're, we're looking kind of at the bright side of things. And the last thing I would say is, you know, a lot of economies are going through this right now. It's not just the U.S., right? In Europe, we have the ECB raising rates very rapidly. 
or even seeing signs of inflation come about in Japan, where it's been absent for a very long time. And so to that regard, on a relative basis, um, you know, maybe the U.S. is still very attractive. So, Rob, which indicator do you think is the most volatile going into November? Right. You talked about gas prices falling, um, uh, talked about rising rent prices, uh, the cost of energy. What do you uh, what are you going to look at um, as seeing the, the being the most volatile going into November? I think you you mentioned that, you know, ga gas prices historically are one of the ones that are most volatile. We've been in this period over the past couple of months where they've been falling very steadily, which is a little bit unusual. Uh, but there's still this risk that commodity prices could jump up again if geopolitical tensions increase and then all of a sudden gas prices are rising. I mean, gas prices are important because consumers tend to see them every day, right? They're just a very visible price that they're dealing with. And so they pay a lot of attention to it and they have a little bit more of a kind of weight in terms of determining how consumers think about voting in the midterms, for example. One concern we have is that gas prices can't decline by 10% month over month forever you know, eventually they're going to stabilize. And we think at that point, consumers will turn back to these products where prices are still rising pretty rapidly. You know, food at restaurants, food in grocery stores, rent prices, as you mentioned, are still kind of up there. So gas prices tend to be the most volatile. But one really interesting thing about the current environment is prices for almost everything are going up right now, which is which is just very, very different to where we were um, 12 months ago. Very true. Um... Okay, next question I have, is there anything, and, and we, we've got just about eight minutes, so is there anything that surprised you in the recent CPI data released last week? Will the data change the trajectory of the Fed's upcoming decision? I think you've already hit on this, um, but is there anything else that you, you would say in this, in this area? Yeah, absolutely. So CPI last week was a big surprise. Um, we and many other forecasters were expecting um, core CPI to kind of continue moderating pretty gradually. Um, we basically did not see that. One of the big upside surprises was um, goods prices uh, in the report, which increased very, very strongly. And it was pretty broad based. We saw increases across apparel, you know, home, home goods and furnishing, um, recreational goods, all of those prices increased. The reason that's so concerning is that everything we know right now about the good side of the economy suggests that prices should be falling, right? Import prices are very, very weak. We're seeing supply chains improve right now. We're seeing anecdotal evidence that retailers have built up excess inventories, for example. And so we had been thinking going into this report, goods prices should be you know, pretty weak overall in August. The fact that they were so strong was a really big surprise to us and a bit of a red flag in terms of the overall inflation generating process, right? It suggests that maybe wages are playing more of a role even on the goods side of the economy. Maybe inflation expectations are even showing up there as well. Now, in terms of what it means for the Fed, um, our view is basically the Fed's going to raise rates by 100 basis points at tomorrow's meeting. Um, that's a pretty aggressive call. It's pretty out of consensus. Right now, the consensus is for 75. But we think that CPI report is enough to make policymakers look up and say, you know what, what we've been doing for the past 12 months might not really be working. Uh, the inflation situation based on those trend measures that we were looking at haven't really improved. And so maybe it's time to try a new strategy, something that's a little bit more aggressive. And so we think it's going to tilt the Fed towards doing a little bit more over the near term relative to what we expected just two or three weeks ago. So how have your determinations of the possibility of a recession changed over the last year? Has it fluctuated? Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, you were sort of surprised uh, about the most recent numbers. So has your uh, has your opinion on this fluctuated um, over the last 12 months? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's funny to think back about just how economic forecasting has evolved during COVID. Um, the type of data fluctuations, the type of environment that we and many investors and businesses are dealing with are just so different. You know, so our forecast in terms of frequency of changes has has been much higher than I would say over the past five or six years. Now, for the recession question specifically. We first started making a recession, our base case, um, back in June of this year. Um, at that point, we thought that we had seen enough data on the consumer side to basically tell us that that rotation from goods to services that we were talking about earlier was faltering. Consumers were pulling back on services spending. And consumers are really the last shoe to drop right now. The housing market is very weak. The industrial sector is very weak because of what's happening uh, abroad with Europe and China.
And so if consumers really start to weaken, then that's really all you need to tip the economy into recession. And so that's when we changed our, changed our forecast. Up until that point, however, we were relatively optimistic that we could avoid a recession, partly because of how much excess savings for consumers had been built up in the economy. By our measures, there were about 2.5 trillion that consumers were sitting on uh, back in June. The issue though is that it became apparent at that point that consumers were using excess savings to cover their expenses, to use them to kind of meet the increase in prices with inflation, but they weren't using them to grow their expenses, which is what you really need uh, for long-term GDP growth, which is what you really need to avoid a recession. And so that was when we made the change. I would say since June, you know, incoming data has been broadly in line with our expectations on the kind of growth side of the economy, even if inflation has been a little bit worse than expected you know, resulting in a more severe response from the Fed. And so our recession call, I think, has been relatively well intact for the past three months. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna give you one final question um, that uh, you talked about wages uh, several times, but how do you see companies responding to the current economic conditions? Um, you know, the labor market has been very tight, continues to be very tight in certain areas. I talked to many of my members who are have job openings that they cannot fill. Um, what do you see happening uh, with wages? What, what, what do you expect companies um, to be doing in this space? So as you said, the labor market right now is just exceptionally tight. We think it's the tightest it's been basically since the late 1940s in the US. Uh, so going back a very long time. Um, in our sense, you know, businesses are responding by increasing compensation. It's not just your hourly earnings or your yearly salary. We are hearing anecdotal evidence of signing bonuses, of retention bonuses to try to keep workers intact, right? So it's really showing up across the spectrum of compensation for workers. And then at the same time, consumers historically are willing to accept higher prices for goods if they know that the prices for everything are going up. And so I think a lot of businesses are turning around and realizing they have a lot of pricing power, right? If they need to increase their prices to offset the higher costs of labor, to offset the higher cost of shipping, they can do that right now. And so that's one reason we're so concerned about this high inflation cycle becoming kind of entrenched. The best measure we have um, of how businesses are responding is the Atlanta Fed's Business Inflation Expectations Survey. The latest data suggests that businesses are expecting prices for services and goods that they charge to be higher to offset those higher labor costs. And so our sense is that so far, businesses has been, have been able to pass on the higher wages to their prices. It's just a question of, how durable is that? Is that likely to be sustained? Well, listen, Rob, we're, we're right at the end uh, of our hour. Um, thank you so much for um, the presentation and answering the questions. I think we're all walking away uh, a bit smarter um, and love to keep in touch and check back in with you um, as, uh, as things keep uh, going along here. So thanks very much. And thank you to all of you who tuned in today. Um, for our fourth um, edition of our Economic uh, Advisory Council. Um, and we'll see you next quarter. Thanks so much, Rob. Thank you very much.